When you physically patch, your hands are on the signal in a very special way. We can make any sound we want. It's extremely flexible in terms of controlling and creating sound. But the whole act of working with the medium, you're really losing touch with the physical world. I think we've lost that in digital synthesis. Hi, I'm Joe Paradiso. I'm a professor here at the MIT Media Lab, where I run the Responsive Environments Group. We tend to look at new kinds of sensor technology and how it connects to people in different ways. When I was an undergraduate in 1975, I started building what was probably the world's largest modular synthesizer, at least over the course of the next decade. One of the beautiful things about modular synths, I think, is that they don't do anything when you turn them on. There's no predefined hookup. You have to put it in yourself. And so it forces you to be creative, to really try to think of something new, because you're starting with nothing. I love the idea of sounds coming from different sources. They're almost like little creatures that kind of appear. They pop their head out, they do their thing. They may be affected by other things around them and they go back down into their hole. The ways they do that is very much a whole part of making a patch you know, listenable and evolve and not be boring. When I first work on a patch, if I work on it fast too, I oftentimes get to a place where it is just too cacophonous and there's too much happening at once. But then I pull it back a little bit. That can transform into something wonderful. I can control the probability of when a sound is going to come with a logic. Ever since I can remember, music was critically important to me. Even as a kid, I was doing a lot of tape loop experiments and just playing with sound before I had the synthesizer. My dad was a photographer, videographer at, at MITRE, actually, at MIT, in Lincoln Lab. But he also loved to build things. I'd sit with him, and he'd, he'd show me what he was doing and taught me a lot. I learned to solder when I was in early elementary school and start wiring up my own things. I was very influenced by the instrument pioneers of the 60s, and Bug Moog and Don Buchla come to mind right away. I got to know them both toward the last bit of their lives, and wonderful people, very inspirational, very unassuming too. Bob built an instrument that could be played. We could bring different kinds of sounds together with patching, and you'd be able to create lots of things that people had never heard before. And then, of course, I got into prog rock when it started coming out, another impetus to build a synthesizer, because that was the vocabulary of prog rock in many ways. I would see these pictures on record covers, I would hear these wonderful sounds. I could never afford to buy one, they were titanically expensive back then, so I had to build one. By the time the early 70s came about, there I was starting to put it together. But then when I postdoc in Zurich, I realized, well, I don't know anybody here. What do I do? Oh, I should start building synthesizer modules. I've got all these ideas. I did the MIT style thing of working in the lab for a night and day, trying to you know, get my work ahead for the first year or so. I took a Casio VL tone and took it apart and built a whole structure around that with a full-size keyboard. Uh, and then I started building modules. At the end, I had 70 modules. So my life just was obsessed by building modules. So I came back from Zurich to do other things, but I didn't neglect the synth. We're creative to survive sometimes, so I use creativity to keep going. The synthesizer is located in MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center. Doing work in science and uh, working with data, you, know, you oftentimes wonder what it sounds like. I approached the physicist at the Fusion Center. I said, well, look, can you give us some of this data and then we can take it and, and try to use it in the patch. My student converted it into WAV files and I edited them and I found all kinds of things. Some of, some of the stuff is very creepy. I mean, if you take data and listen to it in different ways, it can sound almost alive, like some weird life form or sound of an alien cockpit or something like this. My students, yeah, they want to be involved. And they came up with the idea not just of streaming it, which is great, but of trying to let people control it over the web. Controlling a modular that way is, is weird. People loved it. 
the, suddenly it started passing around the world. So we had uh, 40,000 users over the span of some, some week controlling the synthesizer. It was a great thing to see. I think this is a rich palette for the future artists, right? Data is their new palette. The future of music is fascinating because it's changing so fast. Music is a shortcut to the emotion in many ways. And uh, you know, you can see, see things in music, right? You can experience things. You, you can, whole stories come. You know, it's like reading a great book. As humans start to generalize a bit more, as our brain starts to move outside of our head, which is kind of what's happening, right? Because we're offloading so much already to the cloud with our uh, handheld devices as we get wearables, it'll be much more. And once we have implantables eventually, and you look far enough ahead, that's one of the main futures. This is all going to change and music will change. If you look at modulars and AI and new ways of interacting with computers, it's that whole essence of patching and that whole dialogue you have with the physical system that I think is rich and that can be abstracted digitally in ways that we, we haven't thought of.